The second characteristic of the <coughs> leader who can handle power without being corrupted by it has to do with a very sensitive issue of status. <coughs> now, status <coughs> is our ranking in society compared with other people. It has the, the, the uh, sense of ranking. If you look at uh, I, uh, Luke chapter 14, <coughs> parable Jesus told, <clears throat> Luke 14, 8. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor. For a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, give this man your seat. Then humiliated, you'll have to take the least important place. But when you're invited, take the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he will say to your friend, move up to a better place. Then you'll be honored in the presence of all your fellow guests. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. The thing that Jesus is touching in that story <coughs> is this business of status. That is ranking in society compared with other people. Now in the world, status and leadership go together. You can always tell who the leader is in a place, He's got a bigger office than anybody else. <coughs> uh, he's got a better carpet on his floor than anybody else, probably a better desk than anybody else. Parks his car in a place that nobody else can use, and so on. What does that have to do actually with his, with his job as leader? Nothing. It's all to do with status. Now, <coughs> status is used in the secular world to reinforce the position of leadership. And in doing that, it reinforces some of the more damaging aspects of leadership. The whole of our language about leadership is status-loaded. You're promoted up the ladder. Those who are uh, <coughs> leaders are the superiors. The others are the subordinates and so on. The whole of our language and of our understanding of leadership is loaded with this business called status. <coughs> It's one of the chief non-monetary rewards of leadership. One of the reasons why leadership jobs are, are sometimes sought is because people want it for the status. They may not actually get very much more in terms of money. They may work longer hours. They may much carry much uh, heavier responsibilities. Why do they do it? Because they can carry the status that goes with it. They are the manager. They are the CEO. They are the leader, see, the status figure. Now, status is not only assiduously sought for, it is very sensitively protected. That's why in, uh, in society there's such an emphasis uh, sometimes on protocol, uh, on uh, the rights uh, attaching to a position. And people who, who have those positions will defend those, uh, those rights, that protocol, for what? <coughs> Simply because of the status that's involved. And the other thing is that status reinforces the distance between leaders and led, because it's always calling attention to that, dis that uh, distance. Here are some of the manifestations of status, where you can recognize where the status is an issue. Sometimes there are special titles or special forms of address you find that very often in the church, you know, where the minister is the reverend. I don't know why, when you go to church, you don't call the, the um, music leader, music leader Brown, uh, or the children's uh, leader, children's leader Smith. Why do you call the pastor, Pastor Jones? Uh, or the Reverend Jones, or the most Reverend Jones, or the very Reverend Jones? It's a status thing. One of the manifestations of status. Sometimes leaders have special privileges. They travel first class instead of economy class on the airlines. <coughs> Stay in the best hotels, chauffeur driven limos and so on. Many of the salaries in top positions in business 
are determined not so much by the value of the person to the job as a question of status. The company doesn't want to f feel that they pay their uh, top executives lower than anybody else, they lost, lost standing. A lot of that's affected by status. Sometimes it's shown by the deference that's given to leaders outside their normal competence. If a leader makes a joke, everybody laughs heartily, even if it's not a good joke, because it has to be a good joke when he's the leader. The leader expresses opinions on politics or football or any other subject in the face of the sun. Everybody listens respectfully. He might be talking of sheer nonsense, but he is the leader. And people defer <coughs> to their opinions outside the realm of their competency. Also, leaders are given a kind of representative significance. If a department does well, who gets the praise? Well, the manager of the department. Yeah. I've never ever heard praise being given to department so-and-so and their manager. Usually the other way around, the manager and his staff. <coughs> it's very interesting, you know, when you look in the, in the uh, epistles of Paul, he never writes letters to the leaders of the church. You notice that? The letters are always written to all the brethren in Christ Jesus, in Philippi or... Thessalonica, or wherever. In only one case are, are overseers and deacons, men, deacons mentioned. I think it's the letter to the Thessalonians, I'm not sure now, but it says, to all the saints in Christ Jesus and the overseers and bishops. Kind of tacked on at the end. I suspect that the leaders in that church were getting a bit uppity, and Paul went out of his way to put them in their place. Uh, but this representative significance, if the if the is one way people have also of, of relieving them of self of responsibility. Like if the, if the leaders uh, succeed, well, I can be part of the success without very much effort. If the thing fails, well, the leader, he can carry the blame. Now, I think the whole status thing uh, reinforces many of the damaging effects of power. Uh, the distance it creates leads to self-arrogance, uh, to self-aggrandizement, leads to arrogance very often, makes it difficult for people to give up leadership. And it's something that I believe we need to dismantle. Okay, I want you to see what Jesus did with status. <clears throat> if you turn to John chapter 13 just for a moment. John chapter 13, <clears throat> verse 12. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you, he asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for well, that is what I am. I like that. He had no compunction about being Lord. You call me teacher and Lord, that's me, that's right. Perfectly, perfectly natural. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should also wash one another's feet. I've set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. What's that all about, actually? Why did the disciples not wash each other's feet? It wasn't because it was a dirty job. You know why? It was a menial job. In other words, it was a low-status job. Jesus said this. He said, if I, your master and Lord, have washed your feet, I'll let you an example. Here's what Jesus is expressing in that incident. In the church, leadership is a function that is different from other functions but it carries with it no status whatsoever. Leadership is a function that is different from other functions, but it carries with it no status whatsoever. The most liberating thing that ever happened to us in the leadership of the church I was involved was some years ago now when we suddenly discovered this. You see, very often status is not so much sought by leaders. Some leaders seek, seek after status. That's what keeps them in the, in the, in the place. But sometimes it's not the leaders who seek it, it's the people who give it to them. They insist on their leaders being up there, being up on a pedestal. Sometimes it affects, it affects the leader's wives. The, the, the stereotype, the demands that are placed on, a, on a, a church leader's wife are sometimes crippling if they're not within the range of that, that woman's gifts. I remember praying with a young woman in Germany couple of years back, who was engaged to a Lutheran pastor. 
and terrified out of her wits of what it would be like being the pastor's wife. For goodness sake. She was, she, was, she was almost wishing she wasn't getting married at all because she was terrified at the obligation, the expectations on her as the pastor's wife. See. Happens to the uh, minister's kids too, the typical uh, pastor's kids. The expectations are placed on, placed on them. It's all status, you see. Now, the liberating, <coughs> liberating thing is to discover that leadership in the church, certainly, and I believe elsewhere also, doesn't have any status. There are some things the leader does that other people don't do, but status, it does not affect. There are some things the other people do the leader doesn't do, but status does not, does not come into it. And when we understand the principle that leadership is a function, it's a functional thing, the first Henry Ford, I think, had it uh, very accurately. <clears throat> I read something he wrote about leadership. You know what he said? He said, asking who ought to be the leader is like asking who ought to sing tenor in a quartet. Well, of course, the one who's got the tenor voice, isn't that right? Who ought to be the leader? Well, the one who can lead. There's no status involved in it. Now leaders can get down off their pedestal. Now they can forget about the gap between them and other people. They can fulfill their functions and status they don't, do not need to be bothered about. <clears throat> How do you discover... <clears throat> now, let me, let me go back a bit. We have to distinguish between status and honor. Status is artificial. And it generally centers on the role or the office. Honor is something that's quite different. <coughs> Honor is the recognition of value and the expression of that recognition. Honor is natural and has to do with the person. Now, the whole business of honor is very important as far as leaders are concerned, as far as everybody's concerned. There are three measures of value that are important as far as honor is concerned. <clears throat> One of them is intrinsic value. What I mean by that is this. If you have a golden ornament or a golden ring, you can smash it with a hammer, you can chop it into pieces, you can burn it in the fire. After you've done all that to it, there remains an irreducible value. What's that? The value of the gold metal. It survived all that. What we need to understand is that God has given everybody intrinsic value like that. It is given, not earned. That is the first value that has to be established with children. They need to be sure of their value just because they are who they are, not for what they have done. <clears throat> but in managing people, it's essential that we also have a deep understanding of that intrinsic value that is in a person. What the cross tells us is that not even the fall has destroyed that. <clears throat> Fallen man, in God's view, remains worth redeeming. Secondly, there is a value that is due to character. To God, character is everything. And that value is earned, not given. Thirdly, there is the value that is due to performance. Again, that is earned and not given. <clears throat> now, as far as honor is concerned, we have to keep those, it, those value issues very clear. And if you're managing people, if you're leading people, <clears throat> you have to make a clear distinction in your mind between who the person is and what the person is doing, between their intrinsic value and their performance. Their intrinsic value is always worthy, always acceptable. Their performance may or may not be. Honor to whom honor is due, Paul says. 
Jesus always made a clear distinction between who a person is and what a person was doing. And leading people, managing people, you have to do the same. As far as intrinsic value is concerned, even the most destroyed person is of infinite worth to God, acceptable to God. As far as their performance is concerned, that's a different matter. See? Now, when you're, <clears throat> when you're uh, correcting people or, uh, or uh, uh, disciplining people, you have to make that distinction. You have to be able to say and mean it to a person as a person, I wholly and totally accept you. I'm glad to have you on the team. I value you. You're valuable to me. But as far as his performance is concerned, I can't accept that. What's more, I'm not going to accept that. Something has to be done about that. Now, when that distinction is real, you can be as honest and straight up and down as you need to be about correcting a person's performance, and you won't lose them. If you lump the two together and pass judgment on their performance, you will lose them. That's honor. It's a very, very important issue. Status is, is artificial. Status has to do with the office. Honor has to do with the person. And status, I believe, is something we must dismantle uh, in our churches and in our organizations. <clears throat> How do you recognize status symbols? The only distinction I can make that for me is, uh, is useful is to make a distinction between what is intrinsic to the job and what is extrinsic. I'll explain what I mean. If it's intrinsic to the job, it's needed to do the job. For example, if the leader customarily has group meetings in his office, he may need a bigger office than anybody else. If he has lots of reports to deal with, he may need a bigger desk than anybody else. If he does a whole lot of traveling all over the place, he may need to travel first class just to look after his, his physical uh, energy level to, to do the job properly. That's not a status symbol then. It's intrinsic to the job. But where these things are extrinsic, have no real essential application to the job, then I believe they are in danger of becoming just a status symbol. And I believe we need to dismantle them. Now that is generally an educated process that works from the top down. And it's not easy to do sometimes because uh, we're ingrained with that, with that, with that concept, see. And it's confused very often with, in the church, I believe, with wanting to honor leaders, see, and, and show respect uh, towards them. It can get very muddied up with status. But I believe it's because of its dangerous aspects, uh, we need to get rid of it. And one of the most liberating things, I believe, in leadership is to get rid of that. Now leaders can lead. You see, what sometimes happens is that people get fed up with authoritarian leadership, get fed up with the status thing, and so I'm not going to have any of this anymore. We're just going to have a free-floating fellowship and the Holy Spirit leads. Then th things go nowhere because nobody's leading. See? Leaders have to lead. That's your job. Leaders have to lead. That's what you're called to do. But leading, and even leading successfully, although it may gain you honor, honor to whom honor is due, does not grant you any status. See? And I believe we have to teach that and model that uh, <coughs> and liberate ourselves from that, liberate our people from that. And when we do, uh, then I think we'll find a healthy level of leadership that can handle power and not be corrupted by it. Okay? Any questions on that? Or on the issue of servanthood? Or on any of the ground we've covered today?
magnificent power. <coughs> There's no direct uh, correspondence between the two. Power is the ability to control your environment, to achieve your purposes, uh, to get your will done, uh, even in the face of opposition. That's strength or potency, if you like. Status is an artificial ranking in terms of value that says this position is more valuable than that position, this position is higher up uh, than that. So. Is there power that comes with status? I think status is used, status is used to reinforce power rather than giving power. Uh, there are different kinds of, of power being identified, but I don't think status of itself, uh, it doesn't give power. Because you can often find a person who is in uh, a formal position of leadership that has a lot of status with it, <coughs> but just has no capability, no personal capability. And although the status may give him uh, a kind of official power, there's actually no leadership coming from it. And I think a not unusual thing is to find that leadership comes from somewhere else, from somebody who hasn't got the status, hasn't got the formal uh, leadership role, but has got leadership capacity. See. <coughs> so I think status is very inadequate. In, in, uh, it, it, it will not reinforce adequately weak leadership. Yeah. Now there's, no, there's probably in your country no more, uh, no more status loaded position than the President of the United States. I mean, it's surrounded by, by status. I don't think that gives the incumbent any more power than he, than he already has. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Have you got any other insight on how to dismantle? Yeah. I, I think. <coughs> yeah. I think. I think it needs. It needs uh, a clear teaching. Education. Uh, education on that, and secondly, modelling. Uh, <coughs> so that so the leaders begin to model a relationship uh, with their people that sidesteps the whole whole status thing. Uh, because in many, many times in, uh, you know, in, the, in the secular world and in the church, leaders are taught to keep a distance. Uh, you know, don't, don't have personal friends in your congregation. It only causes trouble. To you. And, the, and the, I, I wonder sometimes in the church whether the, the question of dress and even the question of the pulpit and being up there, uh, it's... it's, it's Creating a creating a, a, a distance all the time you know, from people. And I think even even those in those symbolic ways we, we want to try and get a, get away from that. So, yeah. I remember being in a uh, in a Presbyterian church in uh, uh, in the states over on the east coast to speak at a healing service, and it was like a great cathedral. Uh, and there was two thrones. I mean, the, and the senior pastor sat in one throne, and the and the assistant pastor sat in the other throne. And the and a big high pulpit. I got up the pulpit, and I knew I needed a box to see over the top. <laughs> <laughs> so I got down and preached them down on the floor. So, uh, I don't know whether the, whether the pastor was all that thrilled about it, but it made me more comfortable. <laughs> Okay then. <laughs>